Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel, Statistics for Doctors. We are now on tutorial number four of this tutorial series on how to code in R and how to do some common statistical analyses in R. So today we're going to be going into how you can get some descriptive statistics in R as well as how you can plot your data to explore it in preparation for data analysis. Um, with regards to plotting data, this isn't going to be a comprehensive tutorial on plotting. Um, as you're going to see throughout the next tutorials, I'm going to be having some plots and I'm going to go through them. So you'll see how, with specific examples, how R can make certain plots that you might find useful in your own data analysis. So why don't we just jump right into it. So this tutorial has two parts to it. First, I'm going to show you how you can get descriptive statistics in the second part. Um, we'll be using a package called ggplot, um, and I'm going to be showing you how to use that package to make some pretty common plots you might use at the beginning of um, exploring your data. As uh, I told you in the last tutorial, I'm going to be beginning everything with um, instructions on installing the packages that you'll be needing in this particular tutorial, and some of that might change from tutorial to tutorial. Um, so these are the packages you need to install if you haven't done so. Um, I've already installed these packages, of course, so I'm just going to load them now and then we can um, get started with the tutorial. And then, of course, let's disable, disable scientific notation because I dislike it, at least in R, I mean. Um, okay, and once again, we need to set our directory because this is how we're going to ex um, import the data file. And I'm not going to go over this since we've already done a whole tutorial on this. Let's actually import our data file. So we're going to be once again looking at the child aggression study of those 666 kids. So let's import that into our data frame, which we're calling DAT, D-A-T. And what I'm also going to do, like in the last tutorial, I'm going to add the observation IDs. Um, because we're going to need those in the plots. So I don't, I wouldn't typically do this um, if I don't actually need the observation IDs for the data analysis, but given that the actual um, data frame currently doesn't have um, an ID column, I'm going to just make that now using the sequence function, which we've already reviewed, and we're calling that variable child, and then we're going to stick that new vector onto the end of our data frame. So let's just take a peek at our data frame. We'll use head and we'll dat. And there you go. We have our column IDs or our, I mean our participant IDs. Okay. So um, first part, descriptive statistics. Um, there's not much here to really go into because it's pretty straightforward. So um, I believe this function describe is a function in R or a function, I mean, of the psych package in R, which is a really great package. Um, yeah, I believe I'm, I believe it is from the site package. So the way this function works is, uh, at least the way I use it, is two parts. So you define what you want to get the descriptive statistics for. So what we want is descriptive statistics on our outcome measure, which is aggression, as well as all of our predictor variables. And then I typically also put the IQR, the interquartile range, since that's an important piece of information, in my opinion. So you can actually... Um, tell this function to calculate that for you for all of the variables. Okay, so let's actually look at the first part since it looks a little bit more intimidating and complicated. So remember um, back in the previous tutorial, if you want to index or pick out certain columns, um, you can use the square brackets and then before the comma is picking out rows and after the comma is picking out columns. So what we're doing is picking out columns one to six. The reason why is because there's seven columns in this data frame, but remember we just added the seventh column, which is this, which is this participant ID column. So there's no need to get descriptive statistics for the participant IDs. So we're just saying, for, from columns one to six, I want descriptive statistics for them. So I'm going to just open this up because it actually will be quite large. So let's run that line of code and then look at this. Um, so we have our outcome measure aggression and then we have our five predictor variables. 
and it tells you here, this is the sort of the standard output. We have um, the number of observations, the mean observation, the standard deviation of that, of, um, uh, of that particular variable, the median, um, the trimmed mean, which is basically the mean um, with the potential outliers trimmed. Um, you can see there's essentially very little difference between uh, the trimmed and um, just regular um, average. Uh, I forget what MAD means, to be quite honest. Um, anyway, I don't look at it, so I won't go into it. Uh, min and max, it's pretty self-explanatory. What's the minimum value? What's the maximum value? Um, what's the range? And then also really helpful um, is knowing the skew and kurtosis, although to be quite honest, people I think overstate this since I think many, unfortunately, many people are confused about what actually needs to be normal. It's not your your variables themselves, it's it's the residuals. But in any event, um, it does, um, this function does calculate skew and kurtosis, which is uh, very helpful because you can imagine you can put your residuals of your model into this function to figure out their skew and kurtosis. Um, and then you have the standard error and then the interquartile range. Okay, and that's basically about it for getting some very general descriptive statistics of your variables. Another thing, this is sort of a, a me thing, although I think it's a pretty common practice. When I have a data set, one of the things I really want to understand is the correlational structure of my data. Kind of just understanding, you know, what's related to what. So I find correlation matrices are really helpful, just a really simple um, zero order correlations between all the variables, um, just so I get a general sense of how things are patterning. And then the nice thing in R is that there's a function, which we're going to get to, called core plot, which um, plots that correlation matrix. Um, so you can visually see the strength and direction of the association between all of your variables. So the, the function to actually do the correlation is uh, the core.test function here. Um, and then you define what you want the correlation for. So here we're doing it for the entire data frame. Of course, just picking out columns one to six for the reasons I just explained. And then you can set the method. So I'm just doing Pearson correlations, but you can do Spearman correlations or Kendall's correlations. And um, this is more of a habit that I've gotten into over the years. I, I just use M as a generic variable for any model or statistical test. Because as you'll see, when you actually run a statistical test in R, there's a bunch of other um, attributes and information that are computed that aren't necessarily displayed in the output. And you can access those, um, which can be quite helpful. And I'm kind of, and it'll be clear in, in further tutorials why I do that, but even right now you'll see why. So let's just run this function. We're saying M is this correlation, uh, this correlation test function, I mean. So let's run that. There's no output yet because I haven't actually um, entered what M is. So uh, the night. So I'll just show you. Let's type in M, and then we'll use that dollar sign. Remember, the dollar sign allows you to sort of explore a data frame, but it also allows you to explore a list because this is basically what a list is. A list contains multiple different objects of different types of things. So you have R, which are the correlations, the N, the T values or T statistics, the P values, the standard errors, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of see why I like to use this sort of generic variable M whenever I run a statistical test or define a statistical model, because there's all kinds of potentially important information that I can pull out um, that I wouldn't otherwise do if I didn't actually define a variable as being my model. Okay, so let's run, let's actually say, okay, let's look at those correlations. So here I'm using the round function because otherwise it'll chew out just, you know, I don't know how many decimal places, but it'll, it's quite mint, a lot of decimal places. So let's just round it out to uh, three digits just to make it a little bit more easy on the eyes. And there's our correlation matrix. So um, I'm sure m many of you have seen correlation matrices, so I won't go, and this is obviously not a statistics tutorial, um, but there's the correlation matrix with the zero order Pearson correlations between all of the variables um, in this particular study. And then I can do the same thing, get the p-values. So a lot of them are very significant, with the exception of the correlation between diet and aggression. That's not statistically significant. And I suppose also television and diet are also not. Um, 
statistically significant, or sorry, borderline statistically significant, significantly related to each other. Although, let's be honest, if I had to adjust for multiple comparisons, that would not be statistically significant. Okay, so, you know, this is a very helpful. Um, you could just stop there, but I find it much harder to really wrap my head around what's actually related. So that's why I find visualizing the data is really helpful. So this is where the core plot function is quite useful. And this is actually um, going to be our first plot that we're going to be plotting in R for this tutorial series. So core plot, um, you basically define what do you want to plot. And, and here I'm drawing out the correlations with the M number sign R or number sign dollar sign. And then type is lower, meaning I just want the lower half since it's redundant to have both halves. And then a method, there's there's very various um, parameters. You can look up this function on the internet through Google and you can figure out, play with the parameters yourself. Um, this particular method is just how to, how is this function going to um, visually show the strength and direction of the associations between the different variables. And it's gonna use this underlying function called color. And anyway, let's just run it. You'll see what I mean. And there you go. So uh, first of all, we finally use this pane here. So when you run a plot, generally speaking, R will automatically um, uh, expand this pane and show you the plot. And here's our plot. So you can already kind of see this. Is, oh, this is much more useful than just looking at the correlation matrix because you really get a, a sense of what is really correlated with what. So it automatically generates a, a legend here, which um, is you know ranging from negative to positive. And then white is obviously completely orthogonal or zero correlation. So you can tell just already parenting style and television. So the a coercive parenting style and more hours watching television um, are you know, strongly associated with each other in the sort of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 range. And everything else is sort of generally positively associated with each other in the sort of around the 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 range. So there you go. There is how you create correlation matrices and how you can plot those matrices. And that's all I'm going to tell you right now about using descriptive statistics, because really that's sort of the meat and bones of it. And um, in the other tutorials, you'll see how I use um, these functions to get useful information for other purposes, such as um, assessing whether or not parametric test assumptions are met and whatnot. So let's move to part two, which is sort of going to be um, the longer part of this tutorial. And this is talking about ggplot. So first of all, I recommend that you um, go to their website. So this is one of the packages in R that actually has a website. And I've put three references here that I think will be helpful for you. So this is the ggplot website. And on their main page, they have links to tutorials. I encourage you to look them up. Um, there's also reference. The ggplot also has a reference of all the different functions they have within ggplot and how to plot various types of graphs. And then finally, I have here um, just a website summarizing the major graphical parameters um, as a reference for you because you'll you'll learn that that there are certain codes and numbers that correspond to certain graphical parameters. For example, if you wanted a, uh, a, a, a round ring versus a round circle versus a triangle or square in your plots, if you're doing a scatter plot, for instance, there's particular codes for that. And this is the website where you can find those codes. Okay, so I've sort of commented off a, you know, a couple of things that I think are generally speaking just important to know about ggplot and how it works. I think first time users of ggplot might find it very counterintuitive. As you use it more, it will become easier. Um, and you'll find that it really is an amazing package because it really gives you a lot of control over your plots and you can really make some very beautiful plots and you have a lot of they can be customized in many ways which is really nice um, so there's a, sort of a price to pay you know you could make something that's easier user friendly at least at the up initially but then it can't do as much which um, you know ggplot really is about doing a lot um, to create really interesting and, and visually helpful plots so to begin, 
uh, to actually create a ggplot, you actually need to run this code called ggplot um, with the brackets. And you'll see an example of that. Um, and then basically what that does is it creates a new ggplot. After that, you have to make sort of a choice. You either, in that particular function, you're going to define the data, specifically the data frame that you're going to be plotting, and then you define what are the x variables, or what's the x variable and what's the y variable. And then if you do it, if you define your data in the main function, the ggplot bracket function, um, then that's going to apply to what are called all the other layers of the graph. Um, and you'll, you'll, this will be clear in a moment. Um, these layers are defined by what are called geoms, which are, stands for geometric objects. And these are the things that allow you to make specific types of pro plots. So for instance, if you want to make a histogram, there's a geom for histograms. If you want to make a dot plot, there's a geom for dot plots, etc. Um, alternatively, and I don't do this in this tutorial, but I do do this in subsequent tutorials, you can actually just define the data within each layer, not in the main ggplot function. The advantage of this is it, it, doesn't, it won't necessarily make a different plot, but it will make a different plot if you're making complex graphs that are using different data frames that you want to plot within the same plot. And I do do this in one of the subsequent tutorials, so you'll see how I do that. Finally, before I actually show you how to plot things in ggplot, there is this thing called AES, which stands for Aesthetic Mappings. Basically, this is a really important part of a ggplot, including the geoms, is it'll basically are the x and y arguments define what variables are going to be put on the x and y axes, and also, this is where you map the graphical parameters such as color or grouping onto those variables, okay? So let's just dive into it. I find it, this is really high level. Let's use an example to really understand. So for our first ggplot, what we're gonna do is just do a very simple histogram plotting the frequency of the various child aggression scores. So notice here we have the main ggplot function, and as I say up here, we define the data. So we're saying the data that's going to apply to all the layers is this thing called dat. That's our data frame. And then we have our aesthetic mappings function, which is saying the x-axis is going to be aggression, our, our variable aggression, which is our outcome measure. Um, we don't need to define a, the y-axis because we're going to be doing a histogram and it's just automatically going to compute the y-axis because it's going to compute the frequencies of the various scores. And then if you want to set the actual y labels and x labels um, you, manually, you can use, apply these functions. R will automat or ggplot will automatically do it for you. Um, it'll just apply the name of the variable itself. So um, sometimes it's not necessary to reapply, but you know, for, for, for instance, if I didn't run ggplot with these custom x labels and y labels, then it would, for the x-axis, it would just say aggression because that's the name of the variable. Okay. Um, and then finally, this is the, the geom for a histogram. So first of all, let's just run this line of code and see what happens. So uh, it does actually produce the ggplot initially, but there's no data on it. So this is where I think it's helpful to see what I mean by layers. So we have this initial thing, which is like, okay, we've created the ggplot. And now we basically want to paste things onto this ggplot to create our plot. Um, and because it's uh, uh, it's automatically set the... Uh, the x-axis um, tick marks and range um, just based off of the aggression scores. Um, but as you'll see in subsequent um, graphs, you can actually customize both the range of the each axis and the tick marks. But anyway, so let's let's um let's actually run the code and then include the plus sign and see what happens. So notice that R is expecting something more. It's wondering, hey, what's going on? I sh there should be something more, which is basically what this plus sign is saying. And you need to include these plus signs at the end of each ggplot layer. Otherwise, R will get very confused. 
So what it, it's expecting another line of code. So let's run the next line of code, which is the Y label. And let's just see, it should actually, oh no, it won't, it won't plot it now. Sorry, because it hasn't finished plotting. Um, and it's expecting more, so let's plot that, the next line of code. So we've set the Y and X axes. And then finally, I'll walk you through the histogram geom function, which is quite simple. Um, so you, to make a histogram, um, you just say geom underscore histogram. And because we've already defined the data frame and our variable that we're plotting in the main function, it's applying to all the layers. So we don't have to, um, we don't have to define the data again or the X variable again. Um, if we didn't do that, then we would actually have to put it in this geom. Otherwise, we would get an error message. So we're saying color black. So that's going to be the um, color of the actual um, histogram, but it's going to be filled with white. So basically, we're going to have white bars. And then the bin width is basically, this is a customizable parameter. So you can fiddle with this. And you'll obviously see as you fiddle with it that it'll produce different you know, shapes of the histogram. Basically, the bin width, as many of you probably know, is what a histogram is doing. It's binning your data and then um, calculating the frequency of particular values within particular bins. Okay, So let's just run that line of code. And because there's no plus sign at the end of it, it should finish um, the plot. And there you go. There's our plot. So you can see it's made the histogram. Uh, and we've all customized our X and Y axes. And just for the sake of teaching, I'm just going to modify the bin width. I'll just make it 0.2 so you can kind of see what happens. Let's run the whole line of code. You see it makes it a little bit fatter. So if you, you can basically play around um, with the bin width to find the level that is most informative. And by that, I mean not too narrow and not too wide. Okay, so let's move on to our second plot. We're gonna do three plots in this um, tutorial. So the second is a scatter plot, very useful um, to as an initial plot to get an understanding, certainly of any variable, but particularly your outcome variable. And what I'm doing here in this plot is I wanna do a scatter plot of each participant's regression score um, to get a real sense of sort of the spread of the data, are the, or is it you know evenly spread around participants? Are there any obvious outliers, etc.? So again, we've already know this. We have the main function. We're, we're defining the, the data that we're going to be using. But notice we can actually, we're going to actually tell ggplot that this is the particular y-axis variable. It's going to be the aggression scores because we want to see aggression scores for each particular child. So on our x-axis, we're going to have ch the variable child, which is just numbers from one to 666, and then that's gonna plot their aggression scores. Now, uh, I told you moments ago that you can customize the axes. Um, I typically do that because I, um, I don't necessarily like how um, ggplot automatically sets the axes. So the first thing is I set the limits of the axis so that you can basically use this um, function called, you know, I guess it's Cartesian coordinates. So you define the Y limit and then the X limit. So the Y limit is obviously the limit of the aggression score, which we know ranges from zero to five. And then the X limit is just the range of all of our participants. So starting with one to 666. Uh, but we, I put zero there because I want to, I want to have the um, zero point of the graph to be zero. And that's actually leads to the second part of this function is, um, where I define the loc for two things. First, the location of the zero point using this expand um, option within this scale underscore y underscore continuous, and similarly for the x-axis function. Um, and then I can set the tick marks um, using the breaks option. So um, for the scale underscore y underscore continuous function, I'm setting the zero point to zero. Um, which isn't actually the default for ggplot, which is not something I like. So I, this is just me. I like to set it to zero. And then I, I'm making breaks. Again, I'm using the sequence function, which we've already seen. So let's see what I'm doing here. I'm saying from zero to five by 0.5. So what this is going to do is create a vector of, of numbers increasing from zero to five by 0.5. Um, intervals. And that's going to be the breaks along the y-axis. Similarly, 
Uh, I'm going to do the same thing for the x-axis, so from 0 to 666, except I'm going to do it by 50, um, just so my x-axis isn't clogged up with tick marks and tick labels of every single participant. And then again, I'm going to customize, I'm going to tell ggplot what my custom x and y axis labels are going to be. And then finally, we have this humble geom called geom point, which is how we, you do a scatter plot. And um, because this part of the code up um, in the main ggplot function has already defined the data and the x and y variables. I don't need to do it down here because it's applying to all the layers. So what I'm just saying is um, in the geom point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use shape equals one. And one is, those, is a hollow circle. And that's what I'm just going to scroll up a little bit. When I talked about graphical parameters, that's a graphical parameter. So you can um, look at that website to see what I mean. Um, how different shapes of uh, points, for instance, are coded with different numbers. So let's run this whole function now that we've gone through it and see what happens. And there we go. So we have this nice graph, um, or at least I think it's nice, of every single participant's observation on child aggression. Um, so already we get a lot of useful information here. So we see that everything is sort of clustering around two, which is not surprising given that the mean and median are both 1.99. Um, so that's the central tendency of this data. Also, we it already kind of gives us a sense, hey, oh, there's some outliers here. You know, is that an outlier? Is that an outlier? Is that an outlier? And these are things we can, um, we can explore, um, not in this tutorial, but we will explore in a, in a uh, in another tutorial that we're going to be getting to. Okay, and then for the last graph for this tutorial um, is the box and whisker plot, which again is an, an, uh, a great way to uh, identify outliers. So what we're going to do is essentially do the same plot we just did, the scatter plot of each individual child score, but we're going to overlay this scatter plot with a box and whisker plot. Um, in case you don't know, basically what a bo box and whisker plot does is it plots the quartiles of the data. So, um, so the quartiles are basically, you can think of them as percentiles. So the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, which is the median, and the 75th percentile. And then what, um, what the, that's sort of the, the box plot of the box and whis whisker plot is. And then the whisker part of the box plot is that it takes 1.5 times the interquartile range um, on either side of the third quartile and in, in, in the fourth, and I guess the first quartile to then identify an outlier. So an outlier would be something that is beyond those limits. So uh, let's just jump to the um, to the function. So it's exactly the same as the one we did above. Um, we just ran the scatter plot, so I'm not going to go through it. Um, except the difference is we then put a plus sign because we're going to be adding another layer to this plot using this a different geom called geom underscore box plot. And again, we're going to use this, let's say the color's black, and then we're it will automatically identify outliers, but um, as you'll see, I put I I put the alpha of um, I put the alpha of the outliers as zero. What is alpha? Alpha is a common term you'll see in R plots. Alpha basically just means the transparency of a particular um, value parameter. So it ranges from zero be being fully transparent to one being not transparent at all. So I'll just run this as I've currently coded it, and then I'll show you what happens when you make it not transparent. So let's run it. So there you go. Um, here we have our box and whisker plot. Again, it just gives you a little bit more information. Also, don't worry about this warning message. It doesn't matter. Um, this bo box and whisker plot really kind of gives us a lot of information about potential outliers. So we have um, the first quartile, um, which is this the bottom part or the bottom line of the box. The middle line is the median, and then the top line is the third quartile. And then the interquartile range is the first quart or the third quartile minus the first quartile. So you take that range and then you multiply it by 1.5, and that's represented by these little sticks, these little lines here. So anything 
outside, so above or below these lines, is potentially an outlier. Um, and the nice thing about this plot is you can already get a sense of the, patient, the participant IDs of those potential outliers. So what happens, um, the last thing I'll show you in this tutorial is what happens if I actually change the alpha. So let's just put it to 0.5, so partially transparent. Um, so what happens is that ggplot, or this, this geom box plot, will just put all of the potential outliers, um, it'll just show them as outside of these the, um, the whiskers. Now, this isn't that useful for this particular plot because I'm overlaying the scatter plot with this box and whisker plot. So already I, my scatter plot tells me which potential um, participants are outliers. So it's it's a redundant piece of data and honestly it's kind of distracting because it's just repeating um, the participants on the same graph. So that's why I made the alpha as zero. Okay, and that's it for this tutorial. Just a short one. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I look forward to uh, speaking with you next time at our next tutorial. Take care. Bye.